Thank you, Michael, for having an interest in what we do. My question is for you first, how many of you would argue that you have enough information to have an informed opinion on this subject? Hands up. Two? Okay. So uh, it's not a complete waste of time. What we'll do is try and give the rest of you the information. If we go quickly also, you can help me. I need your assistance to learn what it is that you need to know or anybody else needs to know about this project in order to help facilitate it um, taking place. So that's, what, that's the trade-off uh, that I would like to do. Uh, and it is a vision. Let's have a quick look at this little video here. What will be our legacy? How will we be defined? Will they say we reached beyond the possible and created new and exciting landscapes? Will we be known as the city that was progressive, courageous, visionary? The city that created a sense of awe and wonder. That redefined the way people worked, played, and loved. That brought new meaning to art and culture. The city that saw obstacles as opportunities and inspired an entire community to achieve amazing things. And although our future is still unwritten, our story yet to be told, we have a belief. A belief that we have the leadership, drive, and vision to be world-class. That we will have our place in history. Because our legacy is what we make of it. And it begins now. Is this project good for Calgary? If we can answer that question in the affirmative, then we will get to the starting line. And I'll explain to you the city process, the political process that's associated with this. And if we can't answer that question affirmatively, then we should have a different kind of a discussion. So let's talk about the site. Um, it is West Village. And from 1924 through to the 60s, West Village was home to a, uh, a creosote treatment plant. Uh, there are creosote treatment plants in every major North American city. Um, for some peculiar reason, Minnesota has a greater preponderance of them than other places. Uh, not the turn of the last century, but the previous century. North America was built on railroads and telegraph lines. And they had to be treated with waterproof creosote. And a plant is a fairly generous term. What a, what a creosote treatment plant was, was a hole dug in the ground and then they filled it with creosote. Coal tar is the, the, the primary uh, ingredient in creosote. And they floated uh, railroad ties and they floated um, telegraph poles. And, uh, and when enough of it went away, they just simply put more in. And, uh, and that was this site, uh, again, for that period of time. Currently, it is the Greyhound Bus Depot and uh, GSL Chev City and Renfrew Chrysler and the Pump House Theater. And uh, I talked to uh, Stu Kendricks, interesting guy from Greyhound. He would like to be someplace else and both of the, uh, someplace else in the city and both of the car dealerships have demolition clauses in their uh, leases. So they're very well aware. And we think we can incorporate the Pump House Theater into our project. Um, live, work, play is exactly what it means. It doesn't mean the Red Mile. What it means is that a place that people will want to actually live, mixed-use residential, a place where they will want to work, uh, either downtown or in this immediate environs, and where they will want to play. It will have restaurants and it will have bars, but it's not an entertainment district, and I think it's critical to understand the difference. LA Live and some uh, entertainment districts actually are very vital and very alive and uh, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is an opportunity to build and complete our downtown area. That's from uh, the view looking west. Um, at a recent Board of Governors meeting in New York, um, Detroit, Tampa, Buffalo and Edmonton presented their projects. Um, it was interesting because all around the room everybody lit up and said, you know what we're doing in professional sports? We are probably are or are quickly becoming one of the, the most important catalysts in the redevelopment, revitalization, or simply uh, place building in cities in North America. Used to be you'd build a stadium someplace, you'd build an arena someplace, and that would be fine, and you'd live happily ever after. What's happening now, and if you look at this thing in Edmonton or in Detroit, they're phenomenally changing those cities. These are powerful. I could probably keep my mouth shut and wait until Edmonton opens their building in the 
uh, fall of 2016, and I would never have to say another word because we're going to be, not us, all of us are going to be very jealous. Edmonton is about to take another quantum leap forward in terms of uh, civic infrastructure, and they're way ahead of us now, I might add. Um, so how many of you know what a field house actually is? So a field house essentially is a large undemised structure for amateur athletes, most often is defined by a 400 meter running track with eight lanes and um, has a FIFA soccer field and has gymnasia, uh, basketball courts, badminton courts, but it's for, for high performance athletes that might be training for the Olympics or Commonwealth Games or that uh, kind of uh, project or it's also for kids uh, simply to have recreational sports in it. And uh, in this city, we have been trying to build a field house for 30 years. There's a field house society. Um, they've been trying desperately. The city has acknowledged that the field house is the single uh, highest priority item on their recreation facilities and quickly followed by unfunded. And the mayor told me recently himself that, you know what, okay, you've got the message through. We need to build a field house. We've always known that. It's going to happen anyway. And the reason that's germane to this discussion is when we get into the talk about money. Um, in order to facilitate that track, and if any of you have been to Commonwealth Stadium, they have a running track around it, and it kind of has a deleterious effect on the sight line. So what we simply have is very low technology, pull the seats back, uh, for track and field and push them back out for professional football that will be played there 10 times a year. The event center does not need to be bigger. There's an automatic uh, conclusion that people draw that if you build a new event center, which is an arena, you should make it bigger. We don't actually need it bigger. Most modern era uh, event centers are about 18,000 in size. Toronto is uh, 1,500 smaller than we are. Um, they come in around 18 or 18 and a half thousand. K Scotiabank Saddle Dome is 19,289 seats. That's what it has. This facility will have about the same. It'll be, however, ergonomically superior. So it doesn't need to be bigger, it needs to be better. Ergonomics means access, egress, comfort, all of the things that are required to induce people to come out and gather in large groups. 1.8 million people a year go through the Scotiabank Saddle Dome. Um, and we think it's important that we join the modern era of construction, which we'll talk about uh, what that means in a little bit uh, uh, to come. The field house will also have a stadium in it. This is where the football stadium is now. Winnipeg, Hamilton, Ottawa, and Saskatchewan are all building new football stadiums or have built them. They built them for 10 football games. That economic model is difficult to comprehend and sustain, but credit to them, they've done it. They've done it almost largely with public money, and we think we can be ahead of that curve. We think we can do a better job. So there'll be 30,000 seats. We have 35,000 at McMahon Stadium right now. The sweet spot for the CFL, Canadian Football League, is about 30,000. We draw regularly about 28 or 29,000 on the Labor Day Classic or on other uh, special games, you can kind of get above that, but basically you need about 30,000. It's expandable to 50,000 seats for special events, not for Labor Day and not when Saskatchewan comes to play football, but uh, for international and national events. So just go back, to, um, go back to that Edmonton scenario again. They have told me, they're already on the doorsteps of the provincial government looking for financial support to attract international and national events. That's where those things are gonna go because they've got the facilities for it and we will not have that. Um, so 30,000 seats indoor. Um, I'll ask you this question now. Um, some of you have uh, been to football games uh, throughout history. Are you okay if it's indoor or, or are you more natural? Are you hot August night people that say, no, no, I want an outdoor football stadium. It's not natural Canadian football unless it's outdoor. So how many are okay with a covered stadium? Anybody dead set against it? Jeff, you didn't, you're, you're kind of, like yeah. And you know what, so do we. And ideally that's what causes you to think about covered stadiums with retractable roofs. That's about $150 million and is wholly impractical. And also the technology for retractable roofs is fundamentally awful. Uh, most retractable roofs are rarely retracted, particularly in this climate. So it's a little bit of a subordination to the purists who say, you know what, Canadian football should be cold, it should be snowy, and it should be outside. 
uh, but we think we can live with that. The uh, area of uh, transit-oriented development that would be created around of this facility is important. Um, office towers, hotels, mixed-use residential, yes, some bars and restaurants and that type of thing, live, work, play. And, uh, and who would be involved in that development of that would be yet to be determined. Um, the one beautiful thing about representing our ownership group is that they have no uh, hidden agenda here. It's a, it's a really cool agenda. By the way, they could do a lot more with what I'm going to show you is going to be their contribution than this but they want to leave a legacy and, and I think we're happy. If we build this, we think it will cause uh, that to happen. Um, and 10th Avenue right now uh, has been rezoned. Uh, it probably can't handle buildings quite that tall. And, and as you probably know, and as you can see here, uh, this kind of fades down to the river. You may or may not know, there's a old bylaw that says you can't put a shadow on the river. We thought it was actually for the uh, fish. It's not, it's for people. It's a great bylaw. The bow tower was supposed to be two floors higher than it ended up to be uh, because they had to cut them down because of the shadowing rule. So good rule, the thing is we need the people uh, in our city to be able to have access to the riverbank in the sunshine and enjoy it. You know what, I think that's kind of cool. Uh, it's it's a problematic if you want to build something higher in some places, but it, it works pretty well for there. Calgary's economic strategy, showcase Calgary's urban assets to the world. If you uh, pine for the days of 300 or 400,000 population Calgary and no traffic jams and we could park at the Ranchman's Club with no challenges at all, it's past. We have grown, we are going to continue to grow. It's essential that we continue to grow to be a vit vital city and, uh, and that's consistent with the uh, city of Calgary's economic strategy. Grow tourism through enhanced local attractions. This is on the order of London and Paris and New York. What we're talking about here, while it may not be characterized uh, quite that glamorously, is a spectacular project. Not only in its terms of its economics, but in terms of what it's going to do to our skyline and what it's going to do to our city. So um, uh, where people in Calgary can participate in sport and recreation to the extent that they choose, and maybe one of the most important position Calgary is the location of choice to live, visit, meet, do business and invest. So we never had any challenges with that. We've grown 40,000 a year for 15 years, maybe longer than that. Uh, we continue to have some in migration, but in order to attract people to come here, I don't really know why Canadian Pacific came here, but I have a hunch it had to do with uh, economics, I think it had to do with the quality of life, and it had to do with, with the fact of the matter is that this was a good place to re relocate one of Canada's most important and significant uh, businesses. So we want to continue to, to do that. The issues are environmental. If, if you're bored over the Christmas holidays, what I recommend to you is that you go to this website and you read it. It reads like fiction. When I first came across the West Village and the creosote contamination, started to look deeply into this, I couldn't imagine why this story hasn't been written. So here's part of the story. The province of Alberta, someone in the province of Alberta, absolved the polluter of their contamination liability. You're all business people. You know you can't open an, or close a gas station in this city and be absolved of your contamination liability. It just doesn't happen, but they were. This province of Alberta has indemnified the city of Calgary for the contamination liability. That's what situation exists at this moment. And they've done so up until and unless the city disturbs the soil uh, so, we're all smart people. When are we going to disturb the soil and take on the liability? How about never? We haven't for 30 years. There's no reason to believe any thinking person would want to do that. So, we've got a problem. We need to clean up this uh, um, area. Pardon me. We need to clean it up and the polluter has been absolved. Now, uh, you will hear lots of people talking about polluters should pay and of course they should. My guess is that's a lot of uh, litigation and my guess is that will probably take place, but uh, in our lifetime, if we're gonna build this project, we're going to need it to take place sooner than later. Our answer to this is to take as a catalyst, because if the city goes to the province, we think what'll happen is the province will say, hold it, we have a deal, you know what the deal is. Uh, if you go to the federal government, they say, hey, this none of this on us. 
we think that as a catalyst, because of what we want to do and the benefit that could accrue to our city and to our province and maybe even to our country, is we get the city of Calgary, the provincial government, the federal government, and maybe the polluters, I don't know if we'll be able to get them in the room or not, and negotiate how we're going to get this problem dealt with because it needs to be dealt with. And as we speak, the Calgary Municipal Land Corporation, which I will uh, give you a better definition of in a minute, are drilling holes to determine the, uh, the challenge associated with the contamination. Everybody thinks they know how severe it is. Everybody thinks they, it's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars, but nobody actually really knows. Our estimates and our experience throughout North America is that it can be actually quite simple. In Vancouver, uh, at False Creek for the Olympics, where they put up uh, uh, high-rise condos, they simply dug holes, and it was a coal tar site. They simply dug holes, put bathtubs in them, and built the buildings over top of them. It was simple. Now, Vancouver has some of the most stringent environmental development laws in the world. So that's one answer. We're not advocating that that would be our answer, but there is more than one way to deal with the contamination. If, if these were built separately, it would be 2 million square feet and by our estimate about $1.2 billion. If we put them together, uh, 1.4 million square feet and about $890 million. Uh, so there is a great efficiency that's associated. So the field house at this moment is destined to be built at the university. If I were the university, I would want it there too. I'd be really happy. I get a field house. Uh, it's adjacent to, to my students and, and uh, kinesiology labs and etc. And I met with Elizabeth Cannon two days ago and expressed that same thing to her but said if we could uh, have some compromise on their part and uh, we could put it down in our project, perhaps they can get most of what they want and the city can get uh, a wonderful new uh, civic asset. The funding um, is the following. User fee you. Uh, when you come, let's use a hundred dollar ticket. Uh, let's use eight percent for the sake of conversation. It's a hundred and eight dollars. Eight dollars of that would be the user fee which would uh, go into support financing for two hundred and fifty million dollars. Now that's uh, arguably, I, I made a mistake and I called that a ticket tax at the outset. So the critics of this, who ask by the way the very wrong question, taxpayers money for billionaires and hockey players. That's not the question at all. The question is, remember, is this good for the city or not? Um, that's um, the organization's money. Because if I can get $108 for a ticket from you and I can keep that all, I, should, I, I would and I could. Uh, but we also think that you might be amenable to saying, okay, you know what, a portion of my ticket price here is going to go to support this facility and, and I'm okay with that. Now, the market will determine the price of tickets, no matter what we say, you are going to base your buying decisions and your associates based on what you think the value is that we deliver. The ownership group, $200 million in direct equity, so $450 million that we would argue, um, fairly simply and fairly easy, is private investment. This is a public-private partnership, but the facility is owned by the public. Well, why would you do that? Because that's the current structure. That's a very generous structure, and this is an unprecedented amount of private financing going into a private-public partnership. $200 million for the field house. That is taxpayers' money. In order to embrace this discussion, you need to say, yeah, I think we should have a field house. I'm okay if we build a field house. If we evaporate from the face of the earth, we're going to build it anyway. We're going to build it at the university. So we would argue that is not incremental money. But if you said, hold it, that's taxpayers' money, you're dead right. No argument there at all. A CRL for $240 million. How many of you know what a CRL is? Well, you're in a, you're in a, a very large majority. Very, very few people know what it is. A CRL in East Village, it's a community revitalization levy. It is not more taxes, it is taking a portion of taxes, and the example I'm going to use is the bow tower. The bow tower generates about $10 million a year in property tax. They took that for 20 years, $200 million. They allocated that to finance the development of East Village. East Village was then developed. East Village was fundamentally urban blight. Uh, and is now a very, very vital piece of our downtown as a consequence and is going to generate much, much more 
than the $200 million that has been invested in it. We want to do the same thing. Uh, so Fieldhouse, we're, we're clear on that. Uh, CRL, if we build that and hotels, uh, restaurants, bars, uh, mixed-use residential and, and, uh, and commercial office towers are built, the estimate that we have is that it will generate about $900 million to a billion dollars worth of property tax in the future. If we don't build this, it doesn't exist. If we build it, it exists, and that's how this is supposed to work. You're supposed to use that as an incentive to create property tax. We want to take $240 million of that and dedicate it to the project. There will be an ample amount of money also generated in order to deal with the infrastructure. One of your very legitimate questions is, well, hold it, it's not just $890 million. You've got to take West Village and you've got to build streets and, and roads and the things that are there. Well, interesting because in 2010, the city approved an area restructure plan. In that area restructure plan, which did not contemplate our project because it didn't, our project didn't exist then. It was not even an idea. Um, they had to clean up the creosote. They had to build roads, uh, sewers, and uh, and all the infrastructures associated with it. So, um, let's assume for a minute we go away. Uh, that plan uh, will be implemented, or one like it. Our position is. Take that plan, you present it over there, I'll present this one over here, and let's pick the best one. If that's a better plan for West Village, which, by the way, we'll need to clean up the creosote, we'll need to build the infrastructure, then let's do that. But if this opportunity that we're presenting here says, hold it, let's, let's have a look at this and let's see whether or not this might be a superior opportunity, which we think it is, then, uh, then we would look at that. So public-private partnership, it's a feasible funding model. Uh, the location is there because it's large enough to handle this. It's got great connection. We're doing the traffic studies. You will say, well, what about that crow child snarl? What about the traffic issues? Those issues, again, with us or without us, have to be dealt with because it's a, it's a problem today and uh, it's a problem that needs to be solved. Remediation of the site, let's all agree that that's a no-brainer and densification. If our urban sprawl and if the vitality of our downtown is dependent on having things that will have people want to be downtown and enjoy downtown, then this is the kind of project we should have. Uh, why bother? This is the modern era of NHL arenas. Detroit, Edmonton, um, the, uh, Long Island, the Barclays Center are just built. Um, billion dollars being spent on Madison Square Garden, Pittsburgh, New Jersey built, and then kind of the mid to late 90s uh, is the last era. Those buildings, including the United Center in Chicago, are all being slated for uh, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of renovations. And we are back here. Uh, we need to uh, become a part of the new era of building. Um, CFL is even more pronounced. The Toronto Argonauts are moving to Toronto Argonauts are moving to BMO Field. So that leaves us uh, in the distance New in Saskatchewan, Winnipeg, Ottawa, Hamilton, uh, Argonauts move in and, and bless the McMahon brothers, six million dollars in 90 days to build. We could build one of those a week uh, today. Uh, so it served us well and now needs to, uh, to be replaced. What will happen to the Saddle Dome? A committee has been struck. Our landlords are the Saddle Dome Foundation and a committee has been struck. We're funding it uh, from a current uh, fee that we charge on our tickets to study what could be done to it. One of the suggestions that we've made here is that there be an undemised floor in the middle. It creates exhibition and trade space. We have a dearth of exhibition and trade space. We don't have a great convention center. We probably uh, should be spending more time looking at building a convention center, but if you take that, if you take the BMO center and you take our existing convention center, you can start to get some critical mass. Now that's just one idea. If somebody has a better idea, we're, we're all over it. Um, what should happen at McMahon is that it should simply be removed. It's an inverted concrete pyramid. It has no intrinsic value. There's anything you could do with it. But you will create an incredibly valuable piece of property that will accrue to the benefit of the University of Calgary. One of the politicians, when I gave this presentation a long time ago, said, well, we don't own that. I said, you know what? I think it's okay if the university benefits from this whole situation. So beautiful piece of property um, by our estimates on today's market, something on the order of a couple hundred million dollars. 
uh, healthy cities and healthy citizens, get the attention of the world, uh, complete and connect our downtown. This is the final completion and the final connection of our downtown and, uh, and leave a legacy. Um, I said earlier, and you're sophisticated business people, um, there's a lot of different things you could do with $450 million that would yield you better than the outcome will be from this. But the reason I am so proud to represent our ownership group is um, I, I almost wish somebody would attack them because I would take such great pleasure in defending them. They need no defense from me or anybody else. They're great citizens. They want to do something good for our city. We need this uh, kind of a project for all of the reasons that we've laid out here. And, and if you think so, I would like you to become advocates for us. And if you don't think so, I'd like you to help me understand what I need to tell you to give you more information. So